Good morning, everybody. Uh, before I read our scripture for this morning, uh, I would like to share a couple of things of what's going around at the church. Uh, the first is uh, we are incredibly active, even though we are not able to be at church during the day. Um, we are having video content on our Facebook page and our web page every day. Uh, on Sundays, uh, we're doing our digital worship service, which hopefully you're a part of. Uh, Monday through Saturday, I'm doing a little daily devotion that's about three to seven minutes where there's a little prayer, a little scripture, and just a small message from me. Uh, and then on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we are doing our um, uh, a video Bible study um, uh, on the book of James. All of these, if you haven't experienced, you can uh, just go to our, our Facebook page or our web page and you can look at all of what uh, all of what has already been done and then come back every morning to see what is going to happen in the future. The second thing I'd like to say is the session uh, met yesterday. Uh, we are continuing to be a church and we are vowing that we would like to uh, continue as we are. Um, we believe we have an amazing staff that we want to continue to have. We are going to continue to pay our staff throughout the coronavirus uh, time when we're not at church. Because of that, we would really like to ask that everyone to continue with their tithes and their offerings. Granted, you can't just put it in the plate on Sunday morning. Um, if you don't mind, please send uh, your tithes and offerings to the church. Uh, address it as Hope Presbyterian dash admin. Uh, a D M I N and that way, and then the rest of the address that way we'll know it's your tithe and your offering and we will get it to the, to the people who uh, put all that into the bank. We really want to continue on as a church. Um, our, every person of our staff is continuing to work, uh, continuing to strive to make sure that we are continuing uh, to be the church that we have always been. So we would appreciate that. If because of job loss or the stock market or whatever, you just can't continue to give what you are, uh, what you pledge to, please let us know. Uh, shoot me an email or uh, give me a call and that way we can plan accordingly. But more importantly, we want to be able to pray for you all for what's going on in your lives. So please just let me know. All right. All that's out of the way. Let us do our scripture for this morning. It is probably the most well-known verse in the entire scriptures. Uh, it is the 23rd Psalm, and I am going to read it out of the King James Version. Uh, it is the one we learned by heart from the time we were children. If you would like to read it with me, I would welcome you to. Just say it out loud no matter where you are. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I thank you that we are worshiping together, even though we are doing it from wherever we are at our homes, rather than together on a Sunday morning in our sanctuary. Lord, you have blessed us with music and prayer, and you are now blessing us with scripture and your word. Open our hearts today. Open our minds today. Let us hear you, let us feel you, and let us know you are there. Amen. So, how many TV evangelists does it 
take to change a light bulb? One, but for the message of light to continue, please send in your donations today. How many Catholics does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, they use candles. How many Episcopalians does it take to screw in a light bulb? 10, one to screw in the light bulb and the other nine to complain that they like the old light bulb better. How many Amish does it take to change a light bulb? What's a light bulb? How many Baptists does it take to change? Change? How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? Well, there are actually two answers to this one. The first is none, because that light bulb was predestined to go out, and we don't want to go against God's will. The second is everyone. You see, the congregation elects the nominating committee, and the nom nominating committee elects the property committee, and the property committee elects a subcommittee to get a bid about how much it would cost to change a light bulb. It takes two people to go out and buy the light bulb, and then one last person to change the light bulb. One thing Christians can agree on is we like the light better on. We don't want to see light bulbs that have gone out. What's funny is I chose this scripture and the sermon title over four months ago before I ever left Louisville in the first place. I was planning to have an inspirational Lenten sermon on our sin and how it hides in the darkness and how for the betterment of us, God wants us to come into the light and let all of our actions be seen and God healing that darkness. I had no idea that our world would be looking at a very different darkness today. One that a light bulb, even a new one, would not put a dent into. This Sunday morning, Hope Presbyterian's lights are off. The sanctuary is in darkness. And that darkness at hope is nothing compared to the shadow of the valley of death that our country and our world has been going through. I kind of took a second to remember other just drastic and dramatic events that have happened in our country's life. I was a kid in elementary school when the Challenger broke, uh, blew up. I remember standing out in the field because I grew up in Florida watching the smoke and even the solid rocket boosters flutter down to the sea. I remember the fear, the feeling that something was not right and something would never be right again. It changed who I was as a person. I also remember where the exact moment I was during the terrorist attacks of 9-11. I had gotten up to go to work. I had been out of college for just about a, just over a year. I turned the TV on and I saw the flaming building. I remember thinking, what more can happen? Where else is going to be hit? There was fear. I feared for my family. I feared for myself. I feared for our country. They were truly dark times. They were truly times when we, as individuals and a nation, went through the valley of the shadow of death. Neither of these tragedies, however, uh, lasted. They've all had impact, but the fear we experienced went away pretty quick. When the Challenger exploded, we were a little, we were scared at the, at the time, and then a little fearful when the next shuttle went off. But that was a very short time. And even at 9-11, a lot of our fears went away on September 12th. We didn't worry about the safety of our family anymore. Instead, we got angry. We were sad. The fear had lessened 
by an, a drastic amount. Today, though, I'll admit it, I'm scared. I'm scared for my wife. I'm scared for my children. I'm really scared for my parents and my mother-in-law and my grandmother. I'm scared for many of you, if not all of you. What we are going through has never happened before in our lifetimes. We were unprepared for it. And I am truly frightened. And unlike those other events, the fear for our safety is not going to go away anytime soon. It's going to be weeks and even months. Our world is scared. And I don't see that fear going away either. And what makes it even harder is that because of social distancing, we are alone through all this. We cannot group in groups. We cannot give each other hugs of comfort. We are truly, have, we truly have become little lone lambs that have wandered into the shadow of the valley of death. We are in the midst of the 23rd Psalm. And the valley of the shadow of death, though, no matter how frightening it is, no matter how dark it is, it is neither the beginning nor the end of this song. Neither is the coronavirus the beginning or the ending of our story as a congregation, as people, or as a nation. The psalm begins, The Lord is my shepherd. And God has been my shepherd. God has been our shepherd. A shepherd is one who protects us. A shepherd is one who leads us through danger and to peace. The shepherd is the one who risks everything for us and who loves us, even if we don't know it. And our God has continued throughout our whole lives to lead us from one green pasture to another. We have gone into shadowed valleys before, and God has always brought us out to the still waters where we can drink to contentment. At times like this, I hate to say it, I tend to remember the worst three days of my life. It was Unless it was just a few months after Steph and I had been married. We were, I was in my first year of seminary. My grandfather in California uh, was dying of a brain tumor. Every morning I was afraid that I would get a phone call that grandpa had passed. And it was breaking my heart that I couldn't go see him. Because I was in Kentucky rather than being in California with my grandfather. It was beyond a shock when Stephanie got a call. She was sitting on a couch, uh, and I was sitting next to her. And at first she said hi, just like usual. And then she broke into the worst cry I have ever heard in my life. It was not just sadness, but grief. Her, fa her grandfather, who she was incredibly close with, died of a heart attack over that night. We cried together. We packed our suitcases and we went down to Plant City for the funeral. The morning of the funeral, as we were getting up to get ready, I got the phone call about my grandfather. In three days, we lost two of the men we loved the most in this world. It was heartbreaking. It was truly the shadowed valley. But God didn't leave us in that those valley, in that valley. God brought us to the green pasture. That day, both the day we got to Florida, the day of the first funeral, the day when we got to California, 
the day of the second funeral. We were surrounded by family. We were with our parents and our siblings. We were with our aunts and uncles and our cousins. We were with our grandmothers. And we laughed together. And we cried together. And we hugged each other. And we remembered together. And we were family. It didn't stop the mourning, but it got us out of the valley because we were in the pasture. We saw the love of God and we saw the love of our family. And when we went back to Kentucky, which felt way too soon, we were surrounded by our friends at seminary. We were surrounded by our professors and the staff, all of which who reached out to us in love. God's green pasture filled us. The still water calmed us. And our shepherd brought us into a time of love. I trust in my shepherd because Jesus the Christ has always been there for me before. Not one time in my life has Jesus left us to our own, that Jesus hadn't walked with us through the hard times and then rejoiced with us as we made it through the other side. There wasn't one time that our shepherd didn't give us strength, that our shepherd didn't uh, pick us up and carry us when we needed to. The Lord is our shepherd. The psalmist also declares that even while we are in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. We do not need to fear COVID-19. We do not need to fear the economy. We do not even need to fear the end of toilet paper consumption as we know it. For this virus is evil, and the after effects of this are evil. And our shepherd is greater than evil. We will come out of the valley. God is bringing us out of this valley. God is bringing us to the time that we are promised of goodness and mercy. Now, this does not mean that God will make a miracle happen and everything will just go away. And we will get to sing Kumbaya while holding hands, singing around a campfire throughout the world. No. We need to understand that God is not going to make it to where if our faith is strong, we don't have to worry about our family and friends. That's not, unfortunately, how it works. We still need to social distance. We still need to wash our hands for 20 seconds and not touch our face. I can't help myself. I touch my face all the time. This is driving me crazy. We still need to stay home unless we have to, unless we need food or need something to continue on in our lives. Um, Not as we know it, but in a way that we can survive. One one of the ways God leads us as, as our shepherd is by giving us experts and by giving us doctors and nurses and hospital workers to give us the advice we need to tell us a course of action so that we can get through this valley. And sadly, even with all of our faith, and even with following all the guidance of the professionals and the experts, people are still going to get sick. People who we know may even die. And we will mourn. And we will know we are in the midst of the shadow of the valley of death. But we need to remember that is not where the psalm ends. It does not end in the valley of the shadow of death. The ending line of this psalm is how I know we will be okay and we will make it through no matter what. The psalmist says, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a promise. 
we dwell in the house of the Lord. It means that our shepherd will never abandon us. It means our shepherd is with us now, especially while we are afraid. Our shepherd loves us more than we will ever know. And our shepherd from the day we were born is leading us to the house of the Lord. We are in the embrace of our shepherd. We are being brought into the shepherd's own home. We are not alone, even when we are social distanced. For God is with us. God will always be with us. The darkness that we are in cannot compete with the brightness of the shepherd who is always with us. Amen.